host, Michael McAuliffe, and with me in the studio uh, are my co-host, uh, Perry Haichu, and our guest of the, of the day, Bruce Gale, attorney Bruce Gale. You can say hi, Bruce. <laughs> Hi, Bruce. Good morning. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We're going to get right into it. We're, we're expecting a, a phone call in in a few minutes from uh, uh, from one of our legislators and then an update from Upstate uh, a little later on in the program. But I wanted to get right into it with uh, the Nevada elections that are in progress right now uh, in early election, uh, early voting. And uh, we have an article out of the uh, RJ uh, that was just from uh, yesterday that says... Um, uh, likely voters narrowly support legalizing recreational marijuana and it's it's an interesting poll showing that um, 800 likely voters and con uh, conducted by a, a firm called Ben Dixon and Amandi and they found that 47 uh, percent support the measure which is exactly where it was in the RJ poll uh, at the end of September and now 43 percent oppose it which is a drop of three percent from uh, from September and uh, so that's a, that's a pretty good uh, sign and the, pl the poll has a margin of error of plus and minus uh, uh, 3.5 percent so in that sense the poll is uh, is shows that the public is supporting this although um, Anthony Williams who's the special projects director over at uh, Ben Dixon and Amandi says that anytime you're under 50 percent at this point frankly uh, that would make me nervous so um, it does make us nervous and make sure you get all your friends out there to vote when I uh, when I went out to vote last Saturday on the first day of early voting uh, I made sure I took my little old lady neighbor from across the street uh, who who said, well, can you mark my ballot for me because I just don't, I haven't read all these things. And so I did. So we got two votes for yes there. And, you know, you should do the same thing. Vote early, vote often. Uh, and so uh, where we stand now is that um, uh, it looks like there's an enthusiasm uh, gap between the two parties. And um, so that favors uh that favors passage of question two. Oh, the numbers point. are astounding. Yeah, they are. <laughs> Bruce, you have the number of registered voters here. Uh, so where do where do we stand here in Clark County? Well, for now it's good, but you know historically, more Democrats or vote or uh, early vote, mm -hmm. and a lot more Republicans they vote on election day. And so if you think very simplistically that maybe more Democrats are going to vote yes, more Republicans are going to vote no on question two. Mm -hmm. Uh, let's stay tuned. It's not time to break open the champagne yet. Well, you know, that's interesting. I saw an, uh, an article on Politico.com a couple of days ago that talks about this enthusiasm gap and says that um, because of the uh, the split of the never Trump and the the Trump supporters uh, that if it looks like Donald Trump is going down to defeat in the next couple of weeks as it seems to. Uh, but if on election day there is a sweep of uh, East Coast states and there's a, a good possibility that uh, the election will be decided before it, it actually hits the West Coast, then that can have the effect of depressing the turnout that you're talking about because most vo Republican voters, in fact, do vote on election day on their way home from the polls. So if they're hearing that the election is already, the presidential election is already lost uh, before they go to, to vote, it may well depress that turnout even further in the West Coast states. Are we, uh, are we flashing back to the primary where where someone was accusing, uh, or Ben Carson was accusing another one of the candidates of uh, suppressing their vote? I think it was Cruz who was doing that, sending mm -hmm. out the, uh, the robocall saying, oh, you know, we already won yes. the primary. Yeah. You know, don't go out and vote for Carson. You know, it's okay. Just come on over to the winning team over here. Well, you know, nobody really wants to vote for a losing candidate, and and so if if they think that their team is losing, uh, I I do see where that will convince some people to just sit at home and and be able to say, well, you know, I didn't vote for them. You know. Oh sure, of course. There's a lot of bandwagoners out there. Have you ever seen Cowboys fans? Holy cow. <laughs> Absolutely, Christ. absolutely. So you know, uh, we seem to have now uh, over a, over a million registered voters in Clark County, and what kind of uh, percentage do we have so far in early voting? I think it's about fifty percent for Democrats and about thirty-two percent for Republicans. About one hundred seventy thousand wow. registered voters that that have cast I mean, their vote. So seventeen percent of the of the 
uh, electorate uh, has already cast votes just in, in the first, uh, within the first five days or so of early voting. In Clark County. But I want to go back to your comment you were talking about if some Republicans who vote on Election Day see that, you know, it looks like Trump might lose the election, it might suppress their vote on question two. Uh, before, right before I came over here, I was flip, flipping between MSNBC and, um, and CNN, and Nevada, as of this morning, has flipped back to a battleground state as opposed to leaning blue, leaning mm -hmm. towards Democrats. So again, uh, you know, could change on a day-to-day -day basis. And the thing is, as far as we're concerned uh, with question two, uh, you know, I, I have it on eyewitness authority that Republicans do smoke marijuana, <laughs> you know? And, and so it, this is not sheer, purely a lot a of Republicans. right issue. There's a lot of Republicans that smoke cannabis. I know a lot of people who work for the party and for various consulting groups who would definitely be outcast if they were to come out of the cannabis closet mm -hmm. and it's really really disappointing all the way down from uh from walkers knocking on doors all the way up to managers and organizers and things like that who will just they can't cross that line right and it's really really disappointing that people can't even be themselves among their supposed peers and professional colleagues for fear of retribution you know and it really as as i said it's it's not purely a left right issue and as, as you're pointing out uh that being said that the you know when you poll these groups as a whole uh you do get uh, more of a tendency uh for acceptance of this issue on the left and more of a tendency to stick with prohibition on the right sure. and uh what I what I see is that uh, and what we've seen throughout the cycle is that the largest single group of people supporting question two and legalization in the country in general is the under 35 group and there's something like 64 percent of them the problem there is that convincing young people to get out there and vote and it I'm always, talking to you yeah it, it always uh, has you know, been historically it, yeah it, it always has been uh, the the uh, senior crowd votes they vote to protect their social security and other things and uh, they're more conservative on this issue than the electorate in general so uh, it doesn't matter if we've won the hearts and minds if we don't actually win it at the ballot box we're still stuck in a in a regressive system which uh, criminalizes uh, this personal behavior. So it's, it's interesting to see what's happening here with the RJ. Obviously, Sheldon Adelson, who, who owns the RJ, is dead set against this, uh, but um, his own paper is showing that they're losing a little to bit. To the tune of $2 million personally donated against Question 2 recently, and I believe he donated an additional million dollars million, in Arizona. And I, I think saw. he donated another half million in Florida. I don't know if that's true, but I think mm -hmm. he's going after them again. Well, I, I'm fine with him spreading his bets around and, and not putting it all here on the table in Nevada. Right. You know, so we'll, we'll, we'll see uh, where this goes. Uh, we're going to track this over the next couple of weeks. And, uh, oh, finally, in two weeks, this thing is going to be over, you know, for, for, every, for everybody and everything. Uh, Can we talk about, uh, please, about 22% of the voting bloc in uh, Clark County, and that's about 220,000 uh, independent voters. Mm -hmm. Hmm. and how you think they might vote on question two. My understanding, historically, independents tend to lean to the right, but maybe this year they might be leaning left. Yeah, but on, on fiscal issues mostly, like social issues, maybe not so much. It's all situational. You know, this is kind of a, well, I guess this is a fiscal and a social situation tied into one, isn't it? So we'll, uh, we'll see how Well, on, on this issue, though, uh, on, on this poll from the RJ, independents were in, in line with Democrats, with 51% saying they supported, compared to 34% in opposition. Okay. So if, if they do get out there and vote, uh, this uh, question two may have enough to, to make it over the finish line. And uh, I have been, you know, we're, we're going to talk with, with other people uh, later today and in, in the course of the next week or so. Uh, but you know nobody wants to say we're comfortable with this because it's all about getting out the vote and it, it, it always is in in any election um, but what I also saw from the RJ is a, another story uh, by Rachel Crosby and it says for average marijuana user legalization may not alter enforcement in Nevada and, and I'd want to ask you about this because obviously if uh, question two passes the penalties will see a massive overhaul uh, for for cannabis use but in practice uh, says uh, 
uh, Sergeant Craig Lausignon from the Metropolitan uh, Police Department. But in practice, policing won't change that much for the average user, at least. He says we don't go after marijuana users right now. There are more important things to be doing. Uh, he further on says that he clarifies that that um, arrests involving simple possession do happen, but generally, if somebody gets arrested for user amounts of marijuana, it's because they're making other bad choices. Other bad choices. I mean, you know, that that would be like op say yes, opening the door and inviting Metro in. That would be a bad choice. <laughs> Allowing uh, them to search you without a warrant. That's a or bad probable choice. Co cause, you know, I mean, they say <laughs> It's just more double talk from the same people who we've been hearing from this entire time. You know, oh, you know, enforcement most change much. Nonsense. We're going to force the issue. They have not changed their policies proactively, so we're going to force the issue. Well, they say gonna, this is the law, and this is, and so we have to well, enforce so it. So we're going to change the law. And, but what he says here, uh, Lucino, uh, says that uh, buying and using usable amounts of marijuana never come under law enforcement scrutiny. Nonsense. Can you define usable amounts? Is it uh, one ounce or less, or depends, I guess, on your personal use? Is it usable in, in amount how resistance. much you can consume in, in one sitting? Is it is it your your annual supply? Obviously, they don't think it's that. But really, to, to say, you know, where well, usable amounts never come under law enforcement scrutiny is, is just nuts. That's nonsense. I, I mean, I, the last marijuana possession charge I had was over mm -hmm. less than a joint. So I'm not going to sit here and say, oh, you know, a usable amount. I mean, I've heard some, you know, some people say a usable amount, a joint will last them for a few days. And yeah. some people will say, well, do you know what I call it when I have a quarter left? That means I'm out. Yeah. You know, so, yeah. you know, it's just one of those perception things. So. Well, we, we have a guest on the line and we're going to ask him about this. We're going to take a, for, a quick commercial break and then come back with State Senator Tick Sigerbaum. Nevada Care is a premier vertically integrated medical marijuana enterprise which offers top quality medical marijuana, great customer service, and a safe private environment. We carry a wide selection of medical cannabis strains. Our knowledgeable staff will insist you in finding the correct strain for your condition. Our trained professional staff can educate you on various strains for your condition, methods of consumption, responsible cannabis use, and the wellness benefits of cannabis. We aim to help patients achieve a better quality of life. Medical marijuana is a medicine, not an intoxicant. It's about a patient's well being at Nevada Pure. From the moment you make an appointment with us, your care, health, and well-being is our priority. Nevada Pure is located at 4360 Boulder Highway, Las Vegas, Nevada. Check out their entire menu at www.nevadapure.com. Attention medical marijuana patients. Did you know that your medicine could contain pesticides, heavy metals, and even mold? Are you really sure that you're getting the same potency every single time? Well, the answer to that question is simple. DigiPath Labs. DigiPath Labs is a state-approved laboratory run by scientists. So look for the DigiPath Labs quality seal on your next medicine and on the door of your favorite dispensary. To learn more, go to digipathlabs.com. That's D-I-G-I-P-A-T-H labs.com. And we're back with our guest today, uh, Senator State Senator Tick Siegerblom is with us on the phone. And welcome to the show, Senator. Thank you. Wow, it, we're we're finally down to it. We've been working towards this for a long time, and uh, early voting has started. And um, uh, I, we were just discussing that the RJ's latest poll shows a drop in opposition, uh, and. Uh, also, that uh, they had an article uh, which referenced you uh, that legalization may not alter law enforcement in Nevada. And, and let me yeah. ask you first. I think the key, word, the key word is may not. May not. Yeah. Well, for me, the key the key word is when uh, the the Metro Lieutenant says buying and using usable amounts of marijuana never come under law enforcement security. And with me in the studio are, are Perry Haichu, uh, who you know, of course, and, and Bruce uh, Gale, who's uh, also an attorney in the state. And I'm running for judge. And running for judge, yes. And and, and you know, we, we like people who uh, support uh, common sense issues on this. Um, but the, I was asking Bruce, what is a usable amount of marijuana? Is that, that does not seem to be quantifiable. And it just seems to be doublespeak uh, on the yeah. part of the, the uh, lieutenant. Absolutely. And I have people who have been arrested for just having a paraphernalia in their car, you know, having a roach in their car, having a few seeds in their car. Um, so the reality is that was a total misnomer as far as their statement that uh, you, they don't arrest most people. I mean, the fact is, if they stop you for a traffic violation and they smell something and see something, 
they will arrest you. Uh, absolutely, they will. Especially if you're African American or Latino. Yes, um, I, I've seen uh, a study come out that shows that uh, even though they can that people, uh, whether they're they're white, black, or or some shade in between, uh, consume cannabis at roughly the same amount, and yet uh, African Americans are four times as likely to be arrested for simple possession. We're not even talking about higher level offenses. So um, hopefully, uh, question two in in passing will uh, will address this disparity and and break that chain uh, or those chains that, that enslave people who are caught up in the drug war. Absolutely. That's, that's the number one reason to pass it is just to get it out of the criminal justice system so people don't get arrested, don't have to hire lawyers, uh, the, the defense lawyers have to find some else, other things to work on, the, the cops have to worry about something different, the jails have to worry about something different, then the judges have to worry about something different. So the amount of resources just in the criminal justice system that will be diverted once this passes is huge. Yes, and, and this is, you know, and saying they're having to find something else to do uh, does not belittle it at all. There's plenty of other work for all those entities to do. I, I had read uh, statistics showing that uh, in 1973, after the, the start of the war on drugs, the, uh, or at the start of the war on drugs, really, the murder closure rate in this country uh, by police was 80 percent. And as of the most recent year that they had statistics for 2013, it had gone down to 67.5 percent. So people, so law enforcement has been putting more resources towards uh, going after uh, nonviolent uh, personal choice activities and as a result more people are literally getting away with murder. So uh, I'm with you on, on refocusing police priorities. The question or <clears throat> comment I have is, and this is for Tig and Michael and Perry and wh whoever is listening, is, is it the same amount of law enforcement scrutiny, but they're doing more less arrest and they're more likely to issue a citation for small amounts. I've had a couple of potential clients come in and they were in a uh, casino and uh, they were uh, they had um, small amounts of possession of marijuana on them and they were both issued citations. They weren't taken into custody, they weren't arrested. So right, but but they came to use so that cost them five hundred bucks. Sure. The fine is six hundred dollars. Yeah. So, um, you know, just the, the amount of resource just involved with that, just getting the citation is huge. Well, after after I had been on face to face with you back in 2012, and uh, the police came in a week later, and you know they arrested me and they charged me, even though the charges were completely dismissed, and even though uh, I, I had a retinue of attorneys to work pro bono, I still had was out of pocket 1,500 bucks for bail, and that money never came back. So there are a lot of hidden costs uh, in uh, cannabis uh, prohibition. What about the damage to your sister's house? Oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Well, ultimately, that's what that's what insurance is for. Um, but let me ask Tick, what are you hearing about uh, how early voting is going? What I've seen so far, and we just said, is that roughly 17 percent of eligible voters have um, uh, have cast their ballot, and there there seems to be a definite enthusiasm gap between uh, the Democrat and Republican Democratic and Republican parties. Absolutely. So I, I'm talking about a quarter of the vote, uh, the ultimate vote is already in. Um, and the reality is this is not a Democratic or a Republican issue. So just the fact that, that one party or the other party is, is voted more probably doesn't even matter. I mean, the fact is we're, our polls are showing both parties uh, support over 50%, um, and really more of the age thing. But the reality is uh, we're making sure that the young voters come out, which is the key, because those people are you know, 80 90% support of question two. And, you know, our preferred candidate, Bernie Sanders, uh, was uh, just in the past few days ramping up and getting his supporters out there to vote and letting them know that this was not a, uh, a choice to vote for a third party or, or sit on their hands this time. And uh, uh, just in the past few days, he did a, um, a phone bank solicitation and raised a couple of million dollars for congressional candidates. So I, it seems that, that the younger voters are uh, listening and following his lead. And of course, the, the big problem is always trying to, to get people out to vote. Now, it seems here in Nevada, it is as easy as it possibly can be. And that's thanks in no small part to the legislature. Well, if you look at other states like Colorado and Oregon, everybody gets mailed at uh, uh, ballots, they can just mail it in. So, I mean, we, we've got a lot of things we can do to improve the system. But 
But the fact is, we have a very organized system to get people who have already registered to vote, and that's what we're working on now. We're, we're telling everybody, if you're registered, you need to vote. And, and we're, we're dragging them to the polls, we're pushing them to the polls, we're pulling them to the polls, we're busting them to the polls, but, but they're going so far, so that's great. Unfortunately, that's what that's what the Trump campaign has been saying that that the Democrats are busing people to the polls and then to those polls and then to those polls and you know and, 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 and that's, that's not illegal. Right, it's not illegal to do it, and the whole no, idea that not. that you're getting organized groups of people to to vote more than once though is is just absurd. And our election system, from everything that I've seen in in the 40 years that I've been voting, uh, has shown there's remarkable resiliency in the system, and and the ability to catch people who would cheat. And so I I just I cannot remember an incident of voter fraud happening in Nevada. Acorn. Oh, okay. <laughs> I worked against them. I was there when they were registering the Dallas Cowboys or Tony Romo as a, as a Democrat and all that kind of nonsense. They hired a lot, hired a lot of felons right off the street, and they were desperate that, to that, get there. But that was vote registration. That was no one has ever actually voted. The only person we know that's voted twice or tried to vote twice was a Republican woman out in Pahrump. She really? got busted for it. That's right. And, I and remember that. Whether it's left or right, yes, anybody who tries to do that should get busted and be made an example of because the, you know, the sacrosanct nature of our democracy demands the, that we have integrity in the voting system. And from, from everything that I've read and seen, we do have it. Um, our our, um, our in-studio st in producer handed me a note saying that while he was in line to vote, uh, a woman in front of him said that she was voting no on to because she does she felt we don't need more DUIs on the road and you know I'd, I'd like you to address that tick because we see in Colorado the the no on to people are saying well the percentage of uh, of, of pot related DUIs has, has gone up but in fact um, the numbers overall have gone down and and those um, those arrests for cannabis related DUI have essentially remained flat so yeah, absolutely. It's, they, are, they are pulling everything they can to, to lie about this. But the fact is, in both Washington State and, and Colorado, which are the two states that have had legal the longest, uh, DUIs, total DUIs are down. There's more people that show up with marijuana in their blood who for, with a DUI, but they also have alcohol in their blood. And so it, it's really more, now they're, they're testing for it, so it shows up. Right. But, but the fact is, uh, there are no more total, uh, just absolutely just, um, marijuana with nothing else in their system, uh, DUIs, and the total number of DUIs has gone down. And the, the opioid deaths have gone down. I mean, anywhere that legal marijuana is, the, the overall benefit to society is, is uh, undisputable. Without a doubt, because not only are you putting money into the public revenue stream uh, and taking it away from the illicit market, but also uh, from, from something, uh, from an, another study that I see right here, uh, it says that in, in states that have medical marijuana, it does not cause more teenage stoners. And it was published in the uh, journal Drug and Alcohol Dependence and was done by Columbia University, uh, reading a survey of over 50,000 people each year, and said that, um, that legalizing medical marijuana it didn't make teens think that the drug was more readily available. And, and so uh, if teen use is down in those states, once you remove that forbidden fruit nature of, of this issue, uh, then teens are less likely to, to use it. And so if, if it is well regulated and people have a business license at risk if they sell to underage, uh, then uh, they're not going to do it. And I, I just find what the, the no on two people are doing and the other campaigns across the country are just distorting, taking half-truths and distorting them out, out of, you know, all credibility. Well, I remember when I was young, we used to have liquor stores that would sell to younger people because they wanted the money or whatever. You know, we used to have a joke. There was an X and O liquor over on the east side of town. We used to make the joke that if you showed your Las Vegas high school ID, you'd get a discount. Hmm. But, uh, hmm. you know, they have various... Times have changed. Little, well, <laughs> yeah, no kidding. They have little, uh, little teams that go in and kind of like they send kids in, undercovers do, the police will send kids in to try to buy alcohol mm -hmm. from these uh, people and they'll get a fine. And you'll hear, oh, you know, we tested 150 alcohol selling uh, locations and only like five of them, you know, uh, sold, sold booze to minors. What do you think the story would be if five of the 150 dispensaries in a town sold pot to minors? But you never hear about those stories because they are 
self-regulating and they're they, doing a they're pretty damn happy. good job about it. Yeah, and you better believe they tried to do it too. But you know, you never hear that side of the story about how well these places are doing for the most part. So I don't really understand what well, the argument is. Well, on let that. me let me ask you about that, Tick. If if uh, if you did have a uh, you know we we have legalization and then you have um, uh, somebody who is caught uh, selling to kids, wouldn't they be subject to the already in place? Uh, Distributing and trafficking and 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 selling laws that those are not going to be repealed in any way for under twenty one, are they? Oh, oh, exactly. And and the reality is, the, the dispensary is going to lose their license. So mm -hmm. I mean, it's it's there are penalties in place, and that's what we're. I mean, now we have a system where you actually know what you're doing, so you can monitor it. And and if people are doing the wrong thing, we can actually do something about it. One of the reasons we had to go to the medical system was because the law was so unclear that people were being arrested for marijuana possession. And they're saying, well, if I can't get it legally, then then you can't arrest me. And, that's, and Judge Mosley, remember, had actually issued mm -hmm. that opinion. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You know, After the Sin City Co-op guy killed himself, exactly. he was facing life in prison for running a dispensary in 2010 and uh, decided to take his own life. His name was Nate. I hope people don't forget about that story. Yeah. Yep. You know, I uh, obviously, uh, a, as you know, Tick, that um, uh, Sheldon Adelson is is the number one financial supporter uh, of this uh, uh, of the anti uh, crowd here, and he's also, uh, besides donating two million dollars to that here in Nevada, through a million dollars in uh, Arizona just a couple of days ago, and uh, reportedly through half a million dollars in Florida, and and, and, and Massachusetts too. Uh, oh my. You know, and 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 yet at the same, so he's throwing all this money, and at the same time, just before we went on the air, uh, uh, Perry told me that uh, he flashed a, an RJ uh, piece that just came up, saying that uh, Adelson is now going to be pulling his money. Now that he's got public financing, he's going to be pulling his money out of uh, the the stadium that's uh, supposed to get built. So uh, he com he's he's put all this money on the line for that. Now he's pulling that back, and yet he's Indian is giver. Yeah, you know. Um, did, did you see this coming, Senator? Is that why you took that stance against uh, against the stadium bill? Because you know, I, I know you're not shy about you know raising uh, funds, let's say here here in the state, but you seem to be so adamantly against the uh, against the stadium deal. Did you did you smell a rat or a snake in the grass here? Well, I I I, I knew that we shouldn't do anything rush to judgment on this thing, you know. And if you look at Sheldon's history. When he first built the Venetian, uh, he screwed, you know, 80 subcontractors had to file bankruptcy. I mean, his whole history has been to to put something out there and then pull it back, which went um, bait and switch. So I'm not shocked at this at all, and uh, so we'll have to see where it goes. But the fact is, uh, and I'm not sure about the Oakland Raiders either, because they, their whole history is to bait and switch. So mm -hmm. they moved their team around by trying to get the best deal. So mm -hmm. I could certainly see them uh, using this to go back to, to Oakland and use that as leverage to get Oakland to build them a stadium. I, I apologize, guys. I've got to go. But uh, I'll just tell all your listeners, we need to vote for question two. I mean, it's not over, so it's over. So if you haven't voted, and please vote. This is so it. critical. Join a winning team here. All right. Thanks so much for your time, Senator. We'll talk to you soon. Okay. Thank you. All, all right. Back. Great. And uh, we'll be right back just after a quick commercial break. From the soothing sounds of a water wall to the warmth, wood interior, and beautiful artwork, as soon as you enter Sahara Wellness, you are welcomed into a relaxing space where we strive to provide our patients with a healthy balance of mind, body, and spirit. That balance is achieved through a compassionate and knowledgeable staff who possesses both a passion for the medical cannabis industry as well as unrivaled dedication to assisting those in need of a natural method of pain relief. Our bud tenders are available to assist patients in selecting cannabis-based medicine that best suits their needs from our selection of flowers waxes, CBD lotions, and delicious edibles. Sahara Wellness is located at 420 East Sahara Avenue, Las Vegas, Nevada. Check out our entire menu at www.420sahara.com. Hi, I'm Armin Yemenijan, CEO of Essence Dispensaries, and I'd like to let you know a little bit about our company. As a completely complimentary service, our on-site nurse is here to meet with any patient or non-patient to discuss dosing and best practices. We have three convenient locations. We have one location on Tropicana between Decatur and Jones, which is our west side location. Our Henderson location is on the corner of Sunset and Green Valley Parkway, and we're proud to announce that we have the first and only dispensary on the Las Vegas Strip on the corner of Las Vegas Boulevard and Sahara. Our prices are the lowest 
lowest prices in town and the highest quality medicine. Please come and see us at one of our three convenient locations or visit us at EssenceVegas.com. You can also call us at 702-978-7575. Once again, the number is 702-978-7575. And welcome back to the Weekend 702 Nevada Cannabis News Hour. We are here uh, with uh, our my co-host uh, Perry Haichu and our guest Bruce Gale. And Bruce, let's pick up on the discussion that uh, we were having with Tick there, which is about um, uh, selling to minors. And uh, you know, people think that this is going to be uh, a big danger out there. And uh, from what I see in the statutes and the initiative, no, it's not. No medical marijuana establishment. I think is going to insufficiently train their help to run the risk of suspension or revocation of their medical marijuana establishment certificate. Or or uh, retail recreational establishment when, once that comes into play. Yes. For a sale of minor, minor amount. When you know as well as I do, getting involved in this entry is very capital intensive. No doubt. There was a $250,000 minimal capital requirement for each medical marijuana establishment the reality is add a zero on the, at the end of that and that's what we're talking about and every medical marijuana establishment i'm familiar with at this juncture is if they're lucky they're breaking even mm-hmm. and uh some of them are losing money and hemorrhaging money and waiting to see what's going to happen with hey, quite, hey, that's with quite nonsense two. this is a healthy and robust industry <laughs> primed for explosion uh, Yeah, primed for, but right right now sputtering along, I think. (laughs) Um, You know, and and you bring up a good point there, Bruce, in that uh, the businesses uh, or partnerships who have opened these businesses have, even the smaller ones, have a couple of million dollars invested in this. Uh, They're they're definitely into seven figures. And really, what could someplace expect to do if, if they sold to this miner or that miner or even a class full of miners, what would they what would they make? A thousand, five thousand, ten thousand dollars? It just does not make any sense economically that that they would look for that that short term, relatively small amount of cash flow and putting millions of dollars at risk. You know, I, I agree. So it, it just. I, I don't see the sense of that argument. And uh, Oh, I, I was going to chip in with something like please. that. I, was, uh, I watch Shark Tank once okay. in a while. I think, it's, I think it's a great show. I have a lot of fun watching the back and forth. And, uh, and some reporter kind of got them off, off camera and was like, look, how do you guys feel about marijuana? A lot of people have been wanting to get on the show with marijuana related businesses and they all all of them commented and Mark Cuban's like look you know the market's oversaturated you know Snoop's already in it and if Snoop's in it then there's no room for me Snow you know so so I'm out but the rest of them like Lori Grenier and Mr. Wonderful and all them they're all for it they're like oh yeah you know if marijuana was ever like really legal to where their financial representatives would allow them to go for it they would go all in but well, not all in, but they would be very interested due to the profit potential. But what they were all saying, like one basically like taking the line right on the other, you know, mm-hmm. was saying, um, just regurgitating each other's statements, saying basically it's too difficult. Mm-hmm. The regulatory process and all that, it's too hard to get in. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm like, these people have filed hundreds of patents, built dozens of businesses. Some of them are worth multiple billions of dollars with a B. And they're mm-hmm. sitting here telling us that it's too hard, it's too much work to get in too much paperwork, too much this or that, kind of, it boggled my mind. Well, the, uh, if they made billions of dollars, uh, they probably have good accountants and take good advantage of the tax laws and are, are very sharp and savvy, and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, but the fact is that as long as uh, IRS Rule 280E remains in place, mm-hmm. they cannot take deductions for the vast majority of a marijuana business based expense and that makes a difference in many cases between profitability or or loss but but where i was kind of circling back to with all that is Mm -hmm. back to the selling to minors Mm -hmm. if some of the most publicly visible successful business operators in in the country Mm -hmm. are fearful of this because of the regulatory prohibitations or the, how, how strict the regulations are and they just don't want to deal with it. Doesn't that speak well for the amount of regulation that we have put on the industry to say this is relatively safe to not, I don't want to say scare away 
big investors, but for people who have such success to be a little hesitant because of it, that should speak well to these people who have gone through the process and gone through this and so succeeded. So you mean the, the teeth are already in, in the regulation? I, su I suppose so, yeah. What do you think about that, Bruce? I think there's a, a good argument to that. Uh, Perry, I uh, love Shark Tank. I tape every Friday night and I, mm -hmm. I watch it and it's one of my favorite shows. I, I think that, you know, many of the uh, persons on Shark Tank uh, probably will have a change of mind if something happens at the federal mm -hmm. level. Oh, yeah. I think they would be willing to jump in with both feet off 10 toes, 10 oh, yeah. fingers. Yeah, they would find ways to uh, get through that difficult regulatory process that they describe. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, you know, and let, let me divert onto another subject that, that doesn't quite, it's, it's not directly about cannabis, but it, it can certainly get in there. And that's just in the past several days. I, I've seen a couple of U.S. senators uh, say, and uh, most recently John McCain said the other day, well, we're okay if, if we don't... Uh, um, you know, approve a single Supreme Court justice if, if Hillary wins. And, you know, right now we're down from nine to eight. And oh. there, there, is, there is talk in, in certain circles uh, that, well, it wouldn't be a bad thing to let the Supreme Court kind of die out or, you know, or, or get down to three members or something like that. And, you know, that just struck me as, as a phenomenal shift in our government and and you know the judiciary is a co-equal branch and you're you're running for a judicial pr position what do you think about the importance of the judiciary in our everyday lives i've certainly seen how it affects me when i've been in a courtroom but but what do you think about that it's critical there i mean they're 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 the equalizing factor of uh, in avoiding uh, chaos and our in anarchy they are one third well, that's um, what the police say they are. Yeah. They're, they are one-third. They're a co-equal branch of government. And what the U.S. Senate has done, or lack, what they have not done, is comply with their uh, their constitutional requirements. They're, you know, the president is supposed to appoint, and with the invite, and you have the advice and consent of the Senate. And th historically, th this has never happened. There was just, uh, I was watching either MSNBC or CNN the other day, and it had the time period, I think, when Justice Kennedy, uh, from the time that he was nominated till he had a hearing, and some of these other justices, and Garland by far is way in excess. I think it's about 245 days have passed mm -hmm. since mm -hmm. his, his uh, nomination uh, by President Obama. And um, it's... Um, it's the hyper-partisan attitude that's uh, it's captivated the and, country. And for, 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 for one party to say that you know, they're already constitutionally limiting the current president, say he's only got the ability to make judicial nominations in the first three years and the fourth year, well, that's got to be the next president. And now they're saying that, well, if it's not the president we like, then we don't want to give that to the next president. But I guess my question to you, Bruce, is, you know, okay, that's the Supreme Court, high and mighty, highest court in the land. But how do would multiple vacancies and, and, and lessening of, of the number of justices um, affect one down on a district court level? Because ultimately, you know, squabbles on the district court level. Well, it's already affected, it had an effect on, there was a, I can't remember the, the case, that the Supreme Court, uh, it, uh, the very last days of its last term, it was a 4-4 decision. So, oh, man. Uh, and with that result, the uh, the decision of the, the lower court of appeals, United States Court of Appeals, that decision stands and in I, that district. Uh, well, yeah, but I because well, we have a couple of cases where where the the four four decision resulted in letting two lower court rulings stand, which were in opposition. Exactly, and, and so that that's problematic. This, this this shouldn't happen. And you know what the U.S. Senate has not done. It's, I'm not making a partisan argument. I would have a problem if it was a Democratic-controlled Senate. Right. And they did the same thing. Right. right. I mean, the Constitution is real clear. The president's supposed to nominate, and the uh, Senate's supposed to hold a hearing with the vice and consent. Well, no, you know, I, I, I wouldn't. I'll echo that sentiment. I'm not really. I kind of lean lean to the right, mm -hmm. and I'm not really happy with what's going on either because I wouldn't want them doing the same damn thing. You know, I'm not an, as impressed with. Uh, I'm not in a big hurry to put a bunch of Republican judges on. With their socially conservative agenda, no, nor am I, you know, so uh, so encouraged to put Democrats on. I think we should, you know, it's not, it shouldn't be about that. It should just be about, like you said, you run as a nonpartisan, right. as a judge. We should start looking at 
at judges as such and started mm-hmm. looking at their credentials. Once again, like this Mr. Garland they were talking about, um, I saw when Obama gave that speech and the dude was like in tears. He was just like, I'm so you know grateful to be so nominated honored, yeah. for the, oh, so honored and this and that. And he was and well very, qualified. That's what I've what I've heard, but. And it's not about well, it's you know. not about him being qualified yeah. or not. It has nothing right. to do with whether he's it, a good person or not. Politics. It's what he is. He blue or red, and right. that really that's just terrible. <laughs> I don't really know how else to put that. It is. Well, let's talk about Garland because you well, know, no, let, let's let's actually let's take it down to a, to a more local level because okay. because you know obviously you've been an attorney in town for 25, 30 years or twenty eight years twenty eight years, years. You old man and 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 so uh, on on a more local level I I've seen here uh, in Nevada that uh, district court judges it are not exclusively civil or criminal the, those judges have a, a wide range. Of cases that they hear typically not family court that's a special court but in general uh, and so it seems to me that even though anybody can run for judge um, uh, one who's familiar with various aspects of the law it's a it's a better you know a, a better fit I would say because I've seen we've seen some judges in this in this county who are disastrous uh, and so I, I guess where I'm going with this is, given, uh, given the wide range of, um, of issues that a district court judge has to deal with, uh, do you think that these hyper-partisan issues on a, on a federal level echo, you know, echo down and, and do cause any disruption uh, to judges at a lower level? I, you know, is, is it because you're not worried about getting overturned you're not worried about every case going to the supreme court but um does it does it affect uh, lower court thinking i don't, i don't think so much at at the uh, at the state level in our district courts because you know for a case to get from our state district court to nevada court of appeals and it's then the and nevada to the supreme, supreme court, court of yeah. nevada and then for the united states Supreme Court of the United States to grant, you know, cert because there's no automatic uh, appeal. Right. You know, they have to grant a writ of certiorari. Uh, so it has to be, you know, really, you know, u- unique or important federal issue. And so I, I don't see it affecting, uh, having much effect at the state level. Mm-hmm. Um, well, that's well, that's a good, that's a good thing, I guess. Um, we're going to take a, another quick break, and we'll be right back. Stay with us. Getting Legal offers an informative and simple way for you to get your marijuana card. Why come to Getting Legal to get your marijuana card? We have a 99% approval rating and the lowest price in town. Avoid legal problems. Getting Legal can get you legal fast. Ready for a new start? Come in now and get relief from your chronic conditions affecting your quality of life. Call Getting Legal today at 702-979-9999. That's 702-979-9999. Or visit our website at gettinglegal.com to get your marijuana card today. Nevada Pure is a premier vertically integrated medical marijuana enterprise which offers top quality medical marijuana, great customer service, and a safe private environment. We carry a wide selection of medical cannabis strains. Our knowledgeable staff will insist you in finding the correct strain for your condition. Our trained professional staff can educate you on various strains for your condition, methods of consumption, responsible cannabis use, and the wellness benefits of cannabis. We aim to help patients achieve a better quality of life. Medical marijuana is a medicine, not an intoxicant. It's about a patient's well being at Nevada Pure. From the moment you make an appointment with us, your care, health, and well-being is our priority. Nevada Pure is located at 4360 Boulder Highway, Las Vegas, Nevada. Check out their entire menu at www.nevadapure.com. From the soothing sounds of a water wall to the warmth, wood interior, and beautiful artwork, as soon as you enter Sahara Wellness, you are welcomed into a relaxing space where we strive to provide our patients with a healthy balance of mind, body, and spirit. That balance is achieved through a compassionate and knowledgeable staff who possesses both a passion for the medical cannabis industry as well as unrivaled dedication to assisting those in need of a natural method of pain relief. Our bud tenders are available to assist patients in selecting cannabis-based medicine that best suits their needs from our selection of flowers waxes, CBD lotions, and delicious edibles. Sahara Wellness is located at 420 East Sahara Avenue, Las Vegas, Nevada. Check out our entire menu at www.420sahara.com. Attention medical marijuana patients. Do you know what your cannabis actually contains? Are there heavy metals? 
pesticides, or even mold? And what strength is it really? And is it really what you need? Well, the answers to these questions are simple. DigiPath Labs. DigiPath Labs is a Nevada state-approved medical marijuana testing facility whose scientists carefully test products for safety and potency all within the state's rigorous mandate. You can buy with confidence and trust knowing DigiPath Labs has tested your medicine. If you're a licensed grower, dispenser, extractor, or edibles manufacturer in Nevada and want unparalleled customer service and consumer confidence, go to digipathlabs.com and find out what we can do for you. And as a patient, only go to dispensaries that carry the DigiPath Labs seal of approval. That's digipathlabs.com, D-I-G-I-P-A-T-H labs.com. Or call us at 702-209-2429. That's 702-209-2429. Welcome back to the Weekend 702 Nevada Cannabis News Hour. Uh, we're talking about uh, mostly about the election that's upcoming and uh, because this is an issue that is not only in Nevada but it is around the country uh, with five states voting for uh, out uh, flat out recreational legalization and four more states voting for medical marijuana laws uh, and we're seeing movement in in the oddest of places sometimes uh, and we recently on the show we had talked about uh, a, a story where the uh, wife of uh, one of the gubernatorial candidates in Utah Utah had been busted trying to mail herself uh, medical marijuana to an out-of-state address. Uh, and sidebar, never do that. That, <laughs> that is a big mistake. Okay, because what happens is it calls in the federal government, and if they want you, they've got you. Trust me on that one. Uh, but uh, in this particular case, uh, the wife of gubernatorial candidate Mike Weinholt uh, was not uh, prosecuted by federal authorities. Uh, she wound up, uh, they, they decided not to prosecute because the amount was really too small for them to be concerned with. And uh, Salt Lake City uh, District Attorney decided not to because there was a conflict of interest he knew these people so they sent it out to another county DA and uh, the the wife of uh, of this candidate uh, uh, last Tuesday pled guilty to misdemeanor pot possession charge and you know my heart goes out to her. Nobody, especially medical patients, should should suffer the indignity of being charged and, and being certainly uh, being forced to plead to these things. But the reason that I bring this up is because in the wake of that plea, uh, Mike Weinholz has now rolled out a plan to legalize medical marijuana in Utah. Wow. You know, that's just incredible. And he what said... What timing. What, what? Yeah, what timing. <laughs> he said, it's bigger than just my wife and my family. There are thousands of Utahns that are struggling with these very many different types of conditions. And I say bravo well, to No him shit, for they have been for this. decades. Yeah, you know, but you're right, Perry, the timing <laughs> of this. It seems, you know, and I can say that being involved in, in Nevada politics for, for some years now and trying to get the legislature to pay attention to this back in 08 and back in 10. They were like, oh, this isn't an important issue. There are so many other things more important, and this is, you know, low on the ladder and all that, and, and that's true. And this is legalization, recreation, stopping the persecution and prosecution of, of medical patients and responsible adult consumers is never important until you or a loved one is directly involved. And that's what we're seeing here. And I'm not saying he's a bad guy. I'm glad he has seen the light, even if it is at, you know, at the end of his wife's joint. I'm glad that, you know, that he's come to this, <laughs> this point. But, you know, it seems a damn shame that, uh, that so many people are reluctant to get involved in this issue until it hits at home. And it's just, I don't know. What do you guys got to say about that? Well, you know, he's a gubernatorial candidate. And uh, again, this morning on MSNBC or CNN, and this has been discussed before, Utah is a battleground state because you have a non, they're not. Evan McMullen, who's a. They're, the they're a battleground candidate. state since when? Utah is a battleground of, because you have a person that is running. Evan McMullen is a Mormon. Yeah. And he's pulling about 30% of the of the vote there. Uh, and and so the, it's not that Trump or Clinton is going to, to get the majority, but McMullen could conceivably win uh, Utah's six electoral oh, votes. Wow. But even if not, uh, he's pulling so many uh, votes that it, 
it, it makes the, it makes it a battleground for the other two. That's unbelievable. Candidates. A guy I don't even know might have more electoral votes than Johnson, who's been pushing yeah. publicly this whole time. That's crazy. And Bill Wilson. How Johnson. loyal are the freaking Mormons, man? Well, 34, 35, 36 How loyal. percent of the yeah. vote's going to win. Uh, man, what a that's a block I'd like to have a piece of. Good Lord. The, uh, and and yeah, just uh, just yesterday, I read that that Bill Weld, who's the Libertarian vice presidential candidate, has essentially thrown in the towel, and he he said, "Look, you know, we're we're not going to win, but whatever you do, don't vote for Trump." And so um, there seems to be a push, uh, you know, towards reality in that direction. I guess you know nobody expects these third party candidates to win, but McMullen is on the ballot in eleven different states, and. Uh, Including Alaska, apparently the Mormons are the, are one of the largest uh, religious groups in Alaska. I've, something like twenty five percent of the population. I had no idea. And um, uh, so uh, I think that um, I, I think that's right. I may be confusing them with Idaho. I'm not. It's uh, Idaho. I would yeah, believe maybe, it. Yeah, for maybe sure. it is Idaho now. That as I think about it. But the point is, he he could get some electoral votes in this, and that wow. kind of that, that, and that's what makes Utah a battleground. So, um, you know, it, it's interesting to see where it's going. But uh, oh, on a note of that also with Utah, I'm, I'm very happy that uh, the wife was only charged with simple possession for having over two pounds of cannabis. Yes. Yeah, 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 <laughs> really. You know, where, where anybody else uh, pretty much would, would be charged with a felony, and in some places they'd try to la label conspiracy or, or trafficking charges on them. So, uh, you know, it, it's, uh, it, it's interesting, and I don't wish illness upon anyone. Uh, you know, it, ju it just seems, you know, crazy, though, that, that so many politicians won't jump on board of this issue until it, until it personally affects them. It just... Just nuts. Let's get let's get rid of that thing. Uh, I, also, I, I read uh, you know that in Time magazine now that according to Gallup, which is one of the most respected uh, polling organizations in the country, now for the first time, sixty American adults support legalizing marijuana, wow. and that that is, uh, if I may say, an all time high, and. Uh, so this has been going on. Uh, they've been asking these questions for 47 years. And when it started out, only 12 or 13 percent of the public was in favor of it. And in 2013, uh, Americans tipped them into the majority status for legalization for the first time. And that number has steadily grown over the last several years. And so 60 percent of Americans saying enough of this failed war on drugs, enough of ruining people's lives over a plant, and, and enough on of letting these, these gangs uh, and, and illicit traffickers uh, get all the money and control the market. So um, uh, it, I don't know. It, it's int this, is, this is something where we've turned the corner, and I think there's no going back on this. That's, um, what, that's what they said back in the late, the late 60s also, though. You know, we got the momentum. There's no going back now. And then Nixon happened. And then Nixon happened, yep. Yep, so, absolutely true. So, you know, um, it's like you were saying earlier, when you think you got it won, you got to put your foot on the gas harder. Mm -hmm. you, know, you, can't, you can't let these, uh, you know, stomp out that fire of prohibition once and for all. Don't let it sprout up somewhere else. So, so Bruce, they, they say that, um, you know, I, I, I hear him say that this is the most important election of our lifetime. I hear sure. that every yeah, four years. every four years, yeah, yeah. And really it is, because now is only when we're living. And, you know... Um, you know, I, I, I know you're running for district judge and we can't endorse or anything, and I'm, so I'm not pushing it that way. But it is so important for people to get out and not just vote for, um, for the top of the ticket, for the president or for, for a senator or something like that, but all the way down ballot um, into, into university regents, into councilmen, into district court judges and the like. It's just crucially important on the direction our, our government goes. Yeah, you made a comment, or you just made a comment about how important it is, or how ironic that politicians don't get involved in medical marijuana, adult use of marijuana, till it hits home. Well, in a similar vein, a lot of people, they don't really, voters, they don't care about, uh, or don't do much due diligence when it comes to voting for a judge, because uh, it's not important to them until they find themselves embroiled in the, in the judicial system. Yeah. And then they think a little bit differently, so it's too late then, so do your due diligence, do your homework. Yeah, and a lock them up all the time judge is not necessarily a good thing because also it, it, it puts a burden on the taxpayers. If a judge campaigns on how many convictions he gets, I have a, or a, 
I have a problem with that. Yeah, I definitely do. Now, we're about out of time, and I'd like to thank our guest, Bruce Gale. Yes, and, sir. And you can do a little more research uh, on him and get a hold of him. You have a website? www.galeforjudge.com. There you go, and you spell out the F-O-R, right? Yes. Okay, there you go. It's G-A-L-E. There, there we go. And so uh, as we close, I would like to remind people once again of our spectacular, fabulous, over-the-top Halloween party, the fourth annual Halloween uh, that we can is having this Saturday. Uh, it'll be down in Boulder City at a absolutely terrific location and lots of prizes uh, we have great raffles great prizes it's at 115 casa montana court in boulder city nevada it starts at 4 20 p.m and runs all the way till midnight we'll have about a dozen dispensaries cultivation facilities represented with booths there so you can go you know if you have questions for these teams or you're looking to you know uh, looking for the a industry job. or anything like yeah. that this is a great place to do networking meet people meet a lot of like-minded people good vibes always we have a great time uh, it's a nice mellow crowd, no drunks, no fights. Yeah, no, no, fights. no it's 4.20 p.m. To, to, to midnight on the 29th of October this Saturday. So please get out there and show your support. All the money we raise goes directly back into the patient community. None of us take a salary. Mm -hmm. We're very, very blessed to be able to hold these events. and. Uh, you can Just get this information on our Facebook page, uh, the Weekend 702, uh, on the Weekend 702 uh, website. Uh, Weekend702.org. And, 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 and speaking of websites, our studio that we're sitting in right now has a new website that we're going to start pushing. It's www.dbtv.com, Worldwide Digital Broadcasting Corporation.com. If you want to tune in live or call in, go to the website, and they, have, they got all the info for you. They're really cool guys. We're, we're thankful that, uh, that we're working with them. And so we're going to say goodbye till next week. We'll bring you the latest election updates and onward to victory.